seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll hear the text as we go along. It's from Luke, well, it's, there's several texts, actually. It's from Luke 24 is the main one. Of all the people of the passion of Jesus, those connected with his suffering for us, none were so constant as several women from Galilee. They were on the hill watching as Jesus died. From a distance they, they observed. From Matthew 27, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. How close were they to the cross? You'll see some artwork where they're right there. Well, Jesus' mother, Mary, was close enough where he could turn to her and provide for a place for her with John. How close the other women were, I don't think we can say, except I will say they were closer than were the called disciples who, except for John, were nowhere to be seen. The same women followed Jesus' body when Joseph carried it to the tomb for burial from Luke 23. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the command. No ugliness of the leaders or people or visitors to Jerusalem would keep them away. And no one seemed to interfere with them either. They could go along and watch Joseph and Nicodemus bury Jesus. They couldn't linger. The sun was about to set. The day was ending at sunset, the Sabbath day would begin a day that required rest. So for what was left of their Friday hours, they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. They saw the body of Jesus prepared and buried, but they didn't necessarily agree that it was done to their satisfaction. So they got ready. And then as the Sabbath came, with sunset, they rested as required. And the shock, the sadness of the brutal cross certainly lingered with them throughout their day of rest. As constant, as faithful, as caring the women of Galilee were in following Jesus, we only get bits and pieces of their names. Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Clopas, Salome, Joanna, wife of Cusa. On this day of our Lord's resurrection, we remember them, though we remember the women of Easter, the breathless witnesses, and no, I'm not going to run around again to do that, the breathless witnesses. The women of Easter heard the most breathtaking news in this past six weeks here at church, we've been involved with various characters and people from the Passion of Christ, all of them men. We've paid almost no attention to the women of Galilee. As Jesus hung on the cross, our attention was devoted to him and what was going on there, or maybe to those with whom he spoke. As Jesus was put in Joseph's tomb, we're probably more interested that Nicodemus and Joseph came forth from their secret discipleship and finally committed themselves to Jesus in burying him. At least the Gospels pay no attention to what the women said or did or how many tears they shed as they went home that evening after Jesus' burial. The rabbi they loved with all their heart was gone. But on this morning, on this resurrection morning, the women disciples of Galilee are center stage. 
They got up and out of the city. Even before the morning light had dispersed all the shadows in the dark alleys of Jerusalem, at the first hint of dawn, the first light to come after the Sabbath day had begun in the darkness of Friday night, they threaded their way through the city gates and hurried to the caves where the tombs were. They were hoping to express their grief and anoint and their love for Jesus by anointing his body with their selection of spices, their own way. And they they wanted to beat the heat of the day to get out there to do it. And somewhere along the paths, along the roads as they were going up and down, it occurred to them a thought that never occurred to them before. Wait a minute, what about the stone? Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? You ever done that? had a big project in mind, something you really wanted to get done, you're so concentrating on doing the thing, you forget some of the essentials you need, and maybe one of those essentials will prevent you from doing it at all. The stone over that entrance was simply too heavy for these women to move by themselves. Wow, what's going to happen now? Wasted effort? Here's our text, Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Imagine their shock when they came up over that rise and saw that stone open away from the door in this opening. Oh, what has happened here? Did Joseph and Nicodemus come back and in some reason move that body of Jesus? Did the disciples decide they really did now want to get close to Jesus and honor him in his death and somehow leave that stone door open? Or worse yet, did the enemies of Jesus discover the location of his tomb? Did they come and desecrate this holy ground? Did they come and disturb the body of Jesus, not even leaving him alone in his death. But by now they were at the tomb itself. They went in. They looked around. It wasn't hard. It was a small place. They could see Jesus' body was gone. But before they could puzzle about it too much, it's a good thing that God's messenger angel was there. Back to Luke 24. While they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said, do, Why do you look for the living among the dead? The heavenly messengers were two angels. This time, uh, they made a, a visible appearance. Angels aren't always going to be visible. They were in the form of two men. Their robes so white, it was brighter than lightning. And when they spoke, what fantastic, glorious, joyful news. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. These faithful Women of Galilee, constant supporters of Jesus, the first to hear the glorious news of Christ's resurrection. Three simple words that change their lives and that need to keep changing our lives. Christ has risen. Words that allowed them to remember some of the things he had told them especially as he announced that he would rise on the third day. Jesus was risen. This was glorious news. The women weren't allowed to stand around and idly discuss this for a while. God's angels had an assignment for them right away. Go quickly and tell his disciples. So they did. They left. Did you ever wonder what they did with those supplies that they lugged out there? Their spices, their perfumes, linen cloths. 
they drop them right on the spot and run? Were they so taken with this news that they lugged them all the way back into the city? Hard to say. But as they walked, they talked, and they processed what they had just seen, what they had just been told. Fear flooded their minds. The confusion about what it meant. But joy also came. They might not understand how Jesus' body could leave the tomb. We don't. But the joy that came to know that the Lord was not there because he was alive. And while they were going, they kept up their pace, rushing back to Jerusalem with their news, their adrenaline pumping, until Jesus appeared. His first appearance now. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. That is such an anemic word, that translation, greetings. It's rejoice. It carries in it the idea of God's grace, God's gift. Rejoice in all of it. The first to see Jesus alive and to hear his voice. It's enough to take your breath away. They bowed to the ground. They grabbed onto Jesus' feet. Lord, is that really you? Can you really be alive from the dead? We thought you were dead and gone. We thought we'd never see you again. Praise God on high. This is the most powerful work of the Almighty God. Wait a minute. Are we safe coming here, touching you? Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And so they went to tell the disciples and all the others. Now the next phase of the story. The women's breathless news seemed unbelievable. These Galilean women were not outsiders to the disciples. They had known them for years. They knew where they were. They knew where they were staying and gathered behind closed doors. They knew how, how bad everyone felt, how sad and grieving everyone was that the Lord was dead, how excited they were then to come in and that, to know that they had, they had the answer. They had the good news. They rushed up through the streets of Jerusalem, climbing the stairs and the elevations, their hearts pounding, their lungs gasping for air, and they burst through the doors. Jesus is alive! An angel told us, we saw him, he talked to us. They had seen the empty tomb. They had heard the angel's message. They had actually seen Jesus and talked with him. They had the facts. They had good news to tell. And you'd expect the disciples to rejoice and celebrate You'd expect them to say, yes, that's what Jesus told us several times, didn't he say? I go up to Jerusalem, I would suffer at the hands of the Gentiles, I'd be put to death, and I would rise on the third day. Here it is, the third day. Thank you, sisters, you brought us the most welcome news. No. The disciples looked at the women with their news as if they were nonsense talkers. The other believers associated with these 11 were also dismissive. And before you start thinking, and it wasn't a man-woman thing, it was the difference between those who met Jesus and got the straight news and those who were hearing it secondhand because it's so unbelievable. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. The Easter women got that reaction from those who love Jesus. Now imagine the reaction you get when you announce the same thing to a non-believing world today. Maybe it was just too good to be true. Maybe it seemed flat out impossible. 
I suppose we can hardly fault the disciples for their skepticism, though I will anyway. So many of their cherished hopes and dreams have been dashed to pieces in the past three days. But the women persisted. They kept telling the good news. They knew what they heard. They knew what they saw. They knew what they felt with their hands as they held Jesus by the feet. To their credit, Peter and John at least took up the possibility that the news might be correct. They ran to the empty tomb to see for themselves. They saw, they believed the report. Yep, the tomb was empty, Jesus was gone, but they sure weren't positive about what it meant. Mary Magdalene went back to the tomb. After Peter and John were running around, Mary went out there. You know, she left so early when they first saw that open door that she didn't really meet the angel and hear his message. So she was still convinced that Jesus was stolen away, dead and gone. She's bitterly grieving at the tomb when Jesus came to her, called out her name, dried her tears as he dries ours, changed her grief to an expressible joy. The Magdalene now had news to share too. Jesus is alive, I have seen him. Yet another Galilean woman with breathless news to tell. So was their news correct? Had Jesus come alive out of his tomb or was this collective hysteria? Easter's breathless news was proven right in the next hours and days. There were two men heading from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. They were followers of Jesus, and they were so disappointed, walking along, discussing all the things that had happened to Jesus over that Friday, Saturday. So disappointed in his death. But once Jesus met them, once he walked with them, once he opened the Scripture's meaning to them, once he ate with them, they knew the truth. And they ran back all the way to Jerusalem to breathlessly get their news to the disciples. Jesus is alive. He talked to us. We've seen him. But by that time, Jesus had made some sort of appearance to Peter by himself. We know nothing more about that. And that evening, he came and appeared to the 11 disciples behind closed doors. He came to those men so hopeful and yet fearful, so confused and disbelieving, and said, Peace be with you. It's okay. It's it's all right. I'm here. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. So our sisters were right. Jesus is alive, just as they told us this morning. The disciples were hard to convince. That's good for us. You see, there's, there's a theory out there that these disciples stole away the body of Jesus and made up a story of resurrection. They weren't very likely to do that because they didn't believe he would rise. And even when he did, and they had credible witnesses, they were hard to convince that he was alive. But they were convinced now. And they, once they got it, they held on to it to the point of death for themselves. Gradually, more and more people heard what those first breathless women had to say. Their message of the living victorious Jesus was on the lips of the disciples over and over again in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. The apostles proclaimed and wrote about the resurrection of Christ as their primary message. St. Paul wrote that our faith is meaningless and we're the most gullible of people if Jesus did not rise from the dead, but in fact he did. And the only, only the living Jesus can guarantee and assure us that we will rise, that we will have everlasting life. And that is what he does. 
So today, we here at Calvary end our series on the people of the Passion by trying to capture the breathless passion of the women of Easter. Like them, over the years, from the Scripture, we've seen the empty tomb of Jesus. Like them, we've met Jesus and heard his word of peace. Like them, our hearts are convinced that Jesus sacrificed himself for our sins and rose alive to convince us that the sacrifice was complete. We know his promises are true. We believe his heavenly rest has been prepared for us when we die. Christ has risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia, we say. Jesus has risen. His message is now ours to tell. Jesus died and rose for all the world. All who believe this report and news of ours will have eternal life. And those who will not at first to believe need us to come back to them and be persistent like those women again and again to say that Jesus is alive, the victor over sin and death. Christ has risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia.